All right, welcome back. Today we're going to finish up with the neck region by talking about the last couple visceral structures, specifically the structures in the alimentary layer, including the pharynx and the esophagus. Again, the alimentary layer includes the structures that are part of the digestive system. Aliment literally means food. So the alimentary canal, um, which we commonly refer to as the digestive tract, is the canal that food passes through from um, as we digest it and break it down and absorb the nutrients. The parts of the alimentary um, layer that we'll talk about include the pharynx and the esophagus. The pharynx is what we would commonly refer to as the throat. Um, the pharynx is located posterior to the nasal cavity, oral cavity, and larynx. Um, and these represent the three sections of the pharynx. So the top of the pharynx is the nasopharynx. In the picture, you see it again, right behind the nasal cavity. Uh, the middle part of the pharynx is the oropharynx behind the oral cavity. And then the bottom of the pharynx is the laryngopharynx behind the larynx. So nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx. The pharynx extends from the cranial base um, <clears throat> down to about the C6 vertebra. And at its inferior end, it connects to the esophagus. The esophagus then is going to extend down from the laryngopharynx to the stomach. And specifically, it'll go into the cardia of the stomach really soon after it, it um, passes through the diaphragm. The nasopharynx, again, was the most superior portion of the pharynx. It's a posterior extension of the nasal cavity, and the nasopharynx actually serves a respiratory function. Um, the nasopharynx is lined with the same epithelium that we see in the nasal cavity and in most of the respiratory tract. So it has that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Um, food and water should not be entering up into the nasopharynx. Again, this is not a digestive area. The nasal cavities open into the nasopharynx through two coena, um, or these are also called posterior nasal apertures, or sometimes internal nares. They're the passageways, though, where um, the rounded passageways where air goes from the nasal cavity back into the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx lies just inferior to the basilar part of the occipital bone. And so again, it's lying just below um, the base of the skull. The pharyngeal tonsils are present in the nasopharynx. The pharyngeal tonsils are aggregated lymphoid tissues that are present in the roof and posterior wall of the nasopharynx, so the top and back of the nasopharynx. The pharyngeal tonsils are frequently referred to as adenoids, um, specifically when they're inflamed or enlarged. So here you guys see a few things. One, this from here forward is the nasal cavity. Okay, so right behind that is the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx extends here from the posterior apertures down to the soft palate. Um, in a little bit, we'll look at all of the structures that are present in the nasopharynx, but right back here, you do see the pharyngeal tonsil. Again, the posterior superior border of the nasopharynx, it's the pharyngeal tonsil, the um, aggregated lymphoid tissue. Here, on, in this picture, <clears throat> we're, looking, uh, we're looking into the skull, and right here, you can see the two posterior apertures, which are now. Again, the passageways that air passes through as it comes from the nasal cavity, it's going to come through these and then it would come back at us. Um, but we're looking forward into the nasal cavity, so then back this way would be the nasopharynx. Um, a couple other structures to look at when we're looking at the nasopharynx. Um, one is the pharyngotampanic tube. Um, pharyngo, like pharynx, tympanic, like the tympanic membrane. Um, this is also called the auditory tube, or clinically we used to call it the eustachian tube, E-U, eustachian tube. Um, <clears throat> the auditory tube connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx. Okay, so here you can see this, right? <clears throat> Here's the tympanic membrane. 
activate their eardrum. And then in right here is the middle ear. So this in green is showing you the auditory tube or the pharyngotympanic tube. And the tube comes through and connects again over here is where it opens up into the nasopharynx. Um, the area where it opens, the orifice where it opens into the nasopharynx is called the pharyngeal orifice. And this auditory tube is important because it allows us to equalize pressure in the middle ear. Um, just kind of a quick review, as sound waves come in the um, external ear, ear canal, they push on the tympanic membrane, right? And that oscillates um, or moves the tiny little bones, the, um, the stapes, the malus, the incus that we have present in that middle ear. So as we change um, altitude, for example, the amount of pressure changes, and sometimes we need to equalize the pressure on either side of this tympanic membrane. So if the pressure out here is changing, right, and that's pushing on the tympanic membrane, we need to um, adjust the pressure in here in the middle ear so that we don't damage the tympanic membrane. Um, the way that we do that, again, is by adjusting pressure through the auditory tube into the middle ear. Um, <clears throat> there is another small tonsil that's present here, a collection of lymphoid tissue near this pharyngeal orifice. Um, I'll show you on another picture coming up in a second, and that's called the tubal tonsil. Okay, so the pharyngotympanic tube or auditory tube, we said comes from the middle ear and opens into the nasopharynx. Okay, this little section right here, this is showing you the pharyngeal orifice. That's the opening where the tube actually opens um, into the nasopharynx. You'll notice um, this little raised area right here behind it. This is called the torus. The raised area is the torus. And then the mucosa that folds over that area is called the salpingo pharyngeal fold. Okay, so you'll see it's this, this vertical fold right here. Um, over the, um, or by the, the torus or the raised area by the pharyngeal orifice. Now this salpingo pharyngeal fold, this this um, mucous membrane cut that, that's raised and comes and folds over, it's actually folding over a muscle called the salpingopharyngeus muscle. Um, this salpingopharyngeus muscle actually is responsible for opening the orifice, um, the pharyngeal orifice, at the end of the auditory tube. Okay, so in order to equalize pressure in the middle ear, we need to open up um, the auditory tube we open the auditory tube with the salpingopharyngeus muscle. The salpingopharyngeus muscle is located right here underneath this fold of mucous membrane. Now, um, the orifice opens when we swallow. This is why, um, like when you're flying in an airplane, you're changing altitude and the pressure changes and that can cause pain in the ear. So that's why they tell you to chew gum. Right, because if you're when you chew gum, you're constantly making saliva, and you have to swallow that saliva. And it's when you swallow that you're actually able to release that pressure um, in the middle ear. Again, the torus is just the raised area. The pharyngeal recess is a little area posterior to the torus. Okay, so the torus was this raised area right back behind it here. It's kind of a, a posterior and lateral recess. That's the pharyngeal recess. Inferior to the nasopharynx is the oropharynx. Oro, like oral cavity, right? So this is the part of the pharynx that's posterior to the oral cavity. The oropharynx extends from the soft palate um, down to the superior border of the epiglottis, right? So down to the larynx, essentially. The oropharynx has a digestive function. So the epithelium here, the lining here, changes to stratified squamous epithelium, right? So many layers of cells present here um, without cilia present. 
Um, the digestive function of the oropharynx is to initiate the process of deglutition, which is just swallowing, right? Swallowing a bolus of food um, to get it down into the digestive tract. The boundaries of the oropharynx include the soft palate superiorly, the base of the tongue inferiorly, and then two arches form the lateral borders, the palatoglossal arch and the palatopharyngeal arch. Just think about the words, right? Palato, like from the palate up top, glossal down to the tongue. So from the palate to the tongue, and then palatopharyngeals from the palate down to the pharynx. Um, I'll show you the arches in a sec. The oropharynx houses the palatine tonsils. The palatine tonsils are collections of lymphoid tissue that are located bilaterally. Um, in the back of the oropharynx. So these are the tonsils that when you stick your tongue out, you say, ah, you look back um, on the lateral aspects of the oropharynx and you can see the palatine tonsils pretty easily is, even if they're not inflamed. Um, <clears throat> the bed of the palatine tonsils is formed by the superior pharyngeal constrictor. We'll see that the pharynx has three constrictor muscles present the superior most one forms the bed for the palatine tonsils, um, along with the thin pharyngobasilar fascia. All right, so here we see a few things. Um, one right here, the two arrows, these first two arrows that you see right here, those are showing you the arches. Um, so the palatoglossal arch is this first arch right here. The palate is up here, right? So like the roof of your mouth is your, the palate. So from the palate down to the base of the tongue, that, that um, most anterior arch is the palatoglossal arch. And then the inferior arch back behind it is the palatopharyngeal arch. You'll notice here um, the, the structures that are highlighted in green on either side, those are the palatine tonsils. Notice that they're sandwiched in the little recess between the two arches. Okay, so this the little the fossa um, or the, the little depression that's present um, between the arches. This is where the palatine tonsils sit. And again, you can visualize those um, rather easily in the back of the throat. Um, looking here. Um, <clears throat> you can see multiple tonsils. You see the adenoid, right, or the pharyngeal tonsil, the tubal tonsil that we said is right by the uh, pharyngeal orifice of the auditory tube. Here you see the palatine tonsil right on the lateral wall of the oropharynx. A little bit later we'll talk about the lingual tonsil, um, which is the base of the tongue under, underneath the epithelium. Here you can just see, um, I told you guys that the palatine tonsils sit on the superior constrictor, pharyngeal constrictor, and you can see that here. So this is the superior pharyngeal constrictor, and then the pharyngobasilar foss, um, sorry, fascia is what you see in white here. Right? It comes up and connects to um, the basilar surface of the skull. So we'll take a second to talk about um, deglutition, right, or swallowing. Swallowing involves three stages. Um, the first stage is voluntary. The second two stages are involuntary. So during stage one, the bolus of food, right, we, the food is, um, it's chewed, masticated, it's mixed with saliva to moisten it and soften it, and then that, that bolus of food is compressed against the palate, the roof of the mouth, and pushed back into the oropharynx. Um, and this is done mostly because of movements of the tongue and the soft palate. Stage two is again going to be an involuntary, really rapid stage. Um, during stage two, the soft palate is elevated um, it's important that the soft palate is elevated because this seals off the nasopharynx. You remember we said the nasopharynx has a respiratory function. It is not, the bolus of food should not be going up into the nasopharynx because then it has open access to the nasal cavity, right? And it doesn't feel good when you get food or liquid up your nose. Um, so the soft palate should be elevated to close off the nasopharynx. 
Um, <clears throat> and then also the larynx is elevated. Um, the larynx is elevated by the suprahyoid muscles, right? The muscles that are um, above the hyoid. And then also the longitudinal pharyngeal muscles. Um, the longitudinal pharyngeal muscles include the palato pharyngeus. Salpingo pharyngeus and stylo pharyngeus. Okay, so the suprahyoid muscles and these three um, longitudinal pharyngeal muscles are responsible for elevating the larynx. Remember, why would we want to elevate the larynx? Okay, um, elevating the larynx, um, one, helps to shorten and widen the pharynx, so it's easier for the bolus of food to go down. But more importantly, elevating the larynx, remember, forces the epiglottis down. The epiglottis is the lid on the larynx. So it forces the epiglottis down on top of the glottis, so the opening into the trachea is closed off. So now the nasopharynx is closed off up top, Right, the larynx is closed off on the um, the like inferior and anterior aspect. Now the only place for the bolus of food to go is down the throat and towards the esophagus. Um, stage three again is also involuntary. Um, stage three involves a sequential contraction of the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. There are um, three pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Um, they're the superior, the middle, and the inferior pharyngeal constrictors. And they contract again in sequence, so the top, the middle, and the bottom. And those push the bolus of food um, inferiorly until it can go down and then enter into the, the esophagus. Here we see um, the muscles that are involved, um, the pharyngeal muscles that are involved in deglutition or swallowing. Um, in stage two right, of deglutition, we use these three longitudinal muscles. And again, that's to raise the larynx up. Um, the salpingo pharyngeus, you see up here. The palato pharyngeus you see here, and the stylopharyngeus, you can see on both sides. So you can see it here going up to stylo, like styloid process, right, the styloid process. Um, you can see it going up here, but then it goes deep, right? It goes underneath the constrictors. Um, over on this side, you can see um, how, where it comes down and connects to the larynx, right? Because this is the larynx. You can see the epiglottis up here, right? You can see some cartilage poking through. Um, on the next slide, we'll look at the constrictors more. So here you guys can see the um, circular bands of muscle, the three pharyngeal constrictors. The superior right, pharyngeal constrictor, you see how the pharyngobasilar fascia connects that to the, um, the base of the skull, the middle pharyngeal constrictor, and then the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. Those are used in stage three of deglutition or swallowing to actually propel the bolus of food down the throat and into the esophagus. Okay. So first we close off the nasopharynx, um, and we push the bolus of food back towards the throat, we close off the nasopharynx, we raise the larynx, and then we push the bolus of food down the throat and into the esophagus. After the oropharynx, or um, inferior to the oropharynx, we get to the last part of the pharynx, which is the laryngopharynx. Laryngo, because it's behind the larynx. Um, so it's located posterior to the larynx between the C4 and C6 vertebrae. 
The borders of the laryngo pharynx include um, the larynx in the front and then the constrictor muscles on the sides and the back, specifically the middle and inferior pharyngeal constrictors. Um, those form really the outer border of the pharynx though. The inner wall is actually formed by the longitudinal pharyngeal muscles, specifically the palatopharyngeus and stylopharyngeus muscles, which we saw um, a couple slides ago. So the laryngopharynx extends from the superior border of the epiglottis and the pharyngoepiglottic folds, um, which remember like the, the epiglottis curves up and then the folds kind of fold over around the edges, right, to form like the lateral sides of the larynx. Um, so the laryngopharynx extends from that level of the folds in the epiglottis down to the inferior border of the cricoid. So essentially it extends the entire length of the larynx, right, just behind the larynx. Bilateral, so on either side of the laryngeal inlet, either side of the entrance into the larynx, there's a little um, depression, right, called the pyriform fossa. This pyriform fossa is important. Um, it's a, a fossa or a depression and it's covered by a mucous membrane. Um, but deep to the mucous membrane are, are branches to um, two of the laryngeal nerves. So the internal laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve pass right through this um, pyriform fossa. This will be important later clinically when we talk about foreign objects getting stuck um, in the laryngopharynx, and that they like to get stuck right in this little area, um, and that we'll need to be careful of these nerves because they pass right um, just deep to the mucous membrane there. The laryngopharynx narrows at its inferior end um, to become the esophagus. At the cricopharyngeal part um, of the inferior constrictor muscle, okay, so the inferior constrictor muscle is the bottom constrictor muscle, right at the bottom of the throat. Um, at the very bottom of it, right where the cricoid cartilage is, there's a part of the muscle that's referred to as the cricopharyngeal part, okay, like the very bottom of the inferior constrictor. Um, this area is really narrow and it constricts the esophagus, right at the top of the esophagus. This area is referred to as the superior esophageal sphincter. Um, later when we do the abdomen, we'll see that there's an inferior esophageal sphincter. It's called the lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter. Um, but this is at the top of the esophagus. <clears throat> um, so, okay, over here, this area in green, that's showing you that pyriform fossa. So, pyriform fossa, that's an O, pyriform fossa um, on either side of the laryngeal inlet. Okay, so like this is the laryngeal inlet, right, into the larynx. Okay, back here is the, the, um, the throat, right? All of this back here is the throat. So on either side of the inlet, these little recesses, those are the pyriform fossa. Okay, that's important because again, we said that the laryngeal nerves pass through just deep to that. And again, we'll talk about that later when we talk about clinical implications. Um, we see them right here as well. Um, over here, we can see again, the sections of the pharynx. So behind the nasal cavity is the nasopharynx from the soft palate up. From the soft palate down, we have the oropharynx, right back behind the oral cavity, all the way until we get to the top of the epiglottis. Back behind the larynx, right from the epiglottis, which is right here, to the cricoid, which is right here. That's the laryngopharynx. And then the laryngopharynx connects to the esophagus inferiorly. We'll talk about blood supply to the pharynx, starting with the arteries. The external carotid artery um, gives way to the different branches that go deep within the pharynx and then on the superficial uh, muscles of the pharynx. The Looking right here, the external carotid artery is right here. And then you can see the facial branch off the external carotid artery. 
From the facial branch of the external carotid artery, we have got the tonsillar artery and then also the ascending palatine artery. Um, the first branch that you see off the facial right here is the ascending palatine artery, and then the second one is the tonsillar artery. Um, the tonsillar artery is actually, it's going to go um, pass through the superior constrictor and enter into the tonsil, and that's the main route for blood into um, the tonsils, specifically palatine. Um, the external carotid artery, if you look over on this picture, also gives way to vessels that go um, superior up the constrictors and then inferiorly down the constrictors. So looking over here, the common carotid artery is right down here, right next to the internal jugular vein, and then you can see it bifurcates, right, like this. Um, this one that's cut is showing you the internal carotid artery, and then we can see the external carotid artery come up. Uh, the facial artery, you guys can see, come off right here. Right, and then down in this picture down here, um, we saw the palatine and the tonsillar come off of the facial. Um, the two branches of the external carotid artery that I want you guys to see here on this big picture are the ascending pharyngeal artery and the superior thyroid artery. So the ascending pharyngeal artery comes right here, and you see it ascend right up the pharynx, and then all the branches. The superior thyroid artery, you guys see right here. Right? It comes down and then it goes to the top of the thyroid. But as it's heading down towards the thyroid gland, um, there are branches that are going to the pharynx. The external palatine vein drains near the palatine glands um, and ends up collecting into the pharyngeal venous plexus which you see all over the pharynx, and the pharyngeal venous plexus ends up draining into the internal jugular vein. So here, if you look over here, this is showing us the internal jugular vein. Um, you can see the veins of the pharyngeal venous plexus um, all throughout the, um, the pharynx. Ultimately, here you see the pharyngeal vein draining into the internal jugular, and also the superior thyroid vein drains um, the most inferior regions of the pharynx. So if you look down here, the inferior regions of the pharynx do drain some into the superior thyroid vein. And then again, that goes into the internal jugular vein. The tonsillar lymphatics pass inferior laterally to the, the deep cervical nodes, specifically the superior deep cervical nodes, um, which are located by the angle of the mandible. The jugulodigastric nodes are no, located near the internal jugular vein, hence jugulo, like jugular. Um, the jugular digastric nodes are often referred to as the tonsillar nodes because um, they are draining lymph from the tonsils, so they become enlarged when the tonsils are inflamed um, or have some sort of infectious process. The tonsillar ring refers to the incomplete circle or, or ring of lymphoid tissue that's present around the superior portions of the pharynx. So at the top of the throat, we have um, the tonsils, right, that kind of surround the superior pharynx. This tonsillar ring is composed of the lingual tonsils, the base of the tongue, the palatine tonsils at the back um, or the lateral posterior portions of the oropharynx, the tubal, um, tubal, sorry, the tubal tonsils that are up by the um, pharyngeal orifice where the auditory tube opens, and then the pharyngeal tonsil or adenoid, which is the um, superior portions of the pharynx. The nerves of the pharyngeal plexus are served by cranial nerve 9 and cranial nerve 10. So cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve. That's fine. And by now you guys should be comfortable with cranial nerve 10 is the vagus nerve.
Cranial nerve 10 supplies motor fibers to um, almost all of the muscles of the pharynx and soft palate. Uh, this is via the pharyngeal branches of cranial nerve 10. Um, the exceptions here are that stylopharyngeus, which is innervated from cranial nerve 9, it's the glossopharyngeal, and the tensor valley palatini, which is innervated by cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, specifically the third branch. The tri, the three, it's the third branch. Um, also, the inferior constrictor. Constrictor um, does receive motor fibers from the laryngeal branches of the cranial nerve 10. So it's still cranial nerve 10, but instead of the pharyngeal branches that are going to the rest of the pharynx, it's the laryngeal branches, um, specifically the external laryngeal branch and the recurrent laryngeal branch. Sorry, that's really messy. But most motor fibers um, are going to the pharynx via cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, yeah, the pharyngeal branches. Cranial nerve 9, which we said is the glossopharyngeal nerve, supplies sensory fibers to the mucous membrane of the pharynx. Um, <clears throat> except for the very top portions of the nasopharynx. So the anterior and superior nasopharynx is um, innervated mainly from the maxillary nerve. And the maxillary nerve is also um, a branch of the trigeminal, right, cranial nerve 5, except for this is the second branch. Of the thing. Over here, you guys can see cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12 passing um, through the cranium into the neck. Um, <clears throat> if you look, the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve 9, comes down through and comes onto the pharynx. Over on this side, you can see it easier. Okay, so the glossopharyngeal you see going to the pharynx. Um, the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, is um, pretty apparent, and it's got branches that come out um, to the pharynx, and then also remember the laryngeal branches come back up to the pharynx. So here you can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve, um, which came down and curved around, and then it's coming up to the larynx, but then also to the inferior portions of the pharynx, right, the inferior constrictor. Um, over on this side, you can actually see just the vagus nerve and some of its branches better. So this is the vagus nerve right, coming down. You see the how the recurrent curves up and it comes back around to the larynx, but remember it also has branches that go back to the pharynx. Um, up higher here, you see, so the vagus, and then you see pharyngeal branches of the vagus. Superior laryngeal branch, which also goes to the inferior regions of the pharynx. Um, the sympathetic trunk does pass through here, so you can see the, the sympathetic trunk in the plexus as it goes down alongside the common carotid. So um, we're done with the pharynx, we'll move on to the esophagus. The esophagus is a muscular tube that extends from the pharynx down to the stomach. So it extends from the pharyngoesophageal junction, right, the junction between the uh, pharynx and the esophagus, down to the cardial orifice. Um, the cardia is the first section of the stomach, so the cardial orifice is the opening into the cardia, opening into the stomach. The cervical esophagus refers to the superior most region of the esophagus, which is in the cervical region. The cervical esophagus begins at C6 and extends to the inferior border of the cricoid cartilage. The cricopharyngeal part 
um, or the top of the esophagus is constricted. Um, the cricopharyngeal part is the very inferior most part of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. So the very, very bottom of the inferior constrictor, um, right where it's joining to the esophagus, um, is constricted. It's thinner there. And that's referred to as the superior esophageal sphincter. Okay, again, lower in the esophagus, there's a um, lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter. This is at the top of the esophagus um, and really the bottom of the pharynx as well. Um, <clears throat> The esophagus is sandwiched or located between the trachea anterior to the esophagus and the vertebral bodies posterior to the esophagus. Again, this is the cervical esophagus in the neck. The esophagus blends from striated muscle in the top third um, to a mixture of striated and smooth muscle in the middle, and then the bottom third is um, purely smooth muscle. When we look at the cervical esophagus, the top of the esophagus is, is, is in contact with the cervical pleura in the root of the neck, right, which is the top of the, the pleura, the membrane around the lungs. And we see that the thoracic duct, which is the major duct of the lymphatic system, adheres to the left side of the esophagus between the pleura and the esophagus. Uh, the thoracic duct passes up. It's actually more kind of on the right of the of the um, abdomen as it passes up, and then it crosses to the left of the esophagus right before um, it's ready to empty into the left subclavian vein, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, here you see this. So again, the pharynx goes into the esophagus. And the esophagus is going to go into the cardia of the stomach, this first section of the stomach. At the top of the esophagus, this constricted portion is called the upper esophageal sphincter. And that's the um, constricted portion of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. Down here, you see the lower esophageal sphincter, which we'll talk about when we do the abdomen. You can see how the esophagus, it's just posterior to the trachea. And then just behind the esophagus are the vertebrae, which you can see by looking over here. Here, this is the esophagus right here. So it's been cut, but I included this because you can see the lymphatic ducts. Okay, so this is the cisterna chili, this expanded portion. And then this goes up into the thoracic duct. So you can follow the thoracic duct up comes over and it's the left side of the esophagus between the esophagus and the pleura which is right here surrounding the lungs. You can see it come up and then we'll talk about um, how the thoracic duct empties into the subclavian shortly. Arteries bringing blood to the cervical esophagus are esophageal branches of the inferior thyroid arteries. Um, these actually have ascending and descending branches, and the branches anastomose or, or join with each other across the midline of the esophagus. The esophageal veins likewise drain into the inferior thyroid veins. The lymphatic vessels of the cervical esophagus drain into the paratracheal nodes, which are on either side of the trachea, and the in, then the inferior deep cervical nodes. Innervation to the superior half of the esophagus um, is the somatic motor and sensory neurons. The inferior half um, is innervated by autonomic and visceral sensory fibers. So when we look at the cervical esophagus, which is this, in the superior portion of the esophagus, the motor fibers are delivered via branches of the recurrent laryngeal nerves the vasomotor fibers come via the cervical sympathetic trunk. We'll look at the lymphatics that are present in the neck. I mean, there are a lot. Most of the superficial tissues of the neck are drained through um, the superficial cervical lymph nodes. And these are located mostly along the course of the external jugular vein, right? External 
and superficial. Um, then these drain deeper um, into the inferior deep cervical nodes. After that, they go into the supraclavicular nodes. The main group of deep cervical nodes form a chain along the internal jugular vein, right? Deep is internal. Um, the internal jugular vein, the deep cervical nodes, um, are mainly underneath the cover of the sternocleidomastoid. They're deep to the sternocleidomastoid. The other deep cervical nodes um, that are not along that, um, that chain include the prelaryngeal nerves, the larynx, the pretracheal nerves in front of the trachea, um, paratracheal nodes on either side of the trachea, and then retropharyngeal nodes. The efferent vessels from the deep nodes join or merge to form the jugular lymphatic trunks. Um, on either side, the jugular lymphatic trunks will dump into the large lymphatic ducts. On the left side, the left jugular lymphatic trunk dumps into the thoracic duct, and then the thoracic duct um, on the sorry, the thoracic duct on the left side goes into the left subclavian vein. On the right side, the right jugular lymphatic trunk can dump directly into the right subclavian vein, right at the juncture where the subclavian and the brachiocephalic vein meet. Um, or the right jugular lymphatic trunk can empty into the right lymphatic duct, and then right after that, the lymphatic duct empties into the right subclavian. Here you guys see all of that and you should be able to identify these. Um, they'll be important when you get to um, physical diagnosis and work on your physical exam. The superficial cervical lymph nodes, okay, you see superficially here, okay, again along the external jugular vein. The deep cervical nodes are located deep to that. They're um, typically underneath the sternocleidomastoid Right along the internal jugular vein. We also see um, multiple other occipital nodes, right? Retroauricular behind the ear, parotid. Um, you see buccal in the cheek. You see submandibular under the mandible, submental right underneath the chin. You see the um, prelaryngeal pretracheal, paratracheal here in purple, um, superior deep cervical, and then down here are the inferior deep cervical. Um, supraclavicular are not shown, but the supraclavicular view up here. Here you see the lymphatic drainage um, via the lymphatic vessels in the neck. The thoracic duct, remember, is large. It drains lymph from all of the body um, below the diaphragm and the left side of the body above the diaphragm. The right lymphatic duct simply drains to the right above the diaphragm, okay, so not nearly as much. The thoracic duct you see coming up here, passing underneath the brachiocephalic vein and then coming into the left subclavian vein, right where the subclavian is um, going in to form the brachiocephalic. Okay, so the internal jugular vein, the subclavian vein, and they merge, and then you go into the brachiocephalic vein. So what you guys see here, um, remember the, the deep lymphatics, merge to form the jugular lymphatic trunks. So the left jugular lymphatic trunk goes into the thoracic duct and then that empties into the subclavian. The right jugular trunk um, can merge into the right lymphatic duct, which is what you see happening right here, and then go into the right subclavian or the right jugular trunk can go directly into the right subclavian vein. Radical neck dissection is removal of the deep cervical nodes and as much of the surrounding tissues as possible. 
Um, radical neck dissection is done when cancer, typically from the abdomen of the thorax, invades the lymphatics in the neck. The major arteries, the brachial plexus, the vagus nerve, and the phrenic nerve are typically preserved, but most of the cutaneous branches end up being removed. The deep cervical nodes um, are often involved in the spread of cancer, again, from the thorax in the abdomen, um, especially the supraclavicular nodes, which are located um, just kind of above the clavicle along the path of the transverse cervical artery. Node enlargement in the area can be the first clue to the presence of cancer in the region. So looking and palpating the supraclavicular nodes is an extremely important part of the exam. Um, here you see supraclavicular nodes, and here you can see the area um, where you can palpate for enlargement of the nodes. Foreign bodies that are swallowed um, can get stuck in the laryngopharynx, the inferior region of the throat. Specifically, they tend to get caught in the pyriform fossa. Remember, um, the pyriform fossa is the little depression that's located around the area epiglottic fold. Right? So you see here, this is the area epiglottic fold right? in the pyriform fossa where the arrows are pointing, the little depression that's there. So small swallowed objects um, can get stuck in this area. They can puncture the mucous membrane that's here if the object that's swallowed is sharp. Um, and if that punctures the mucous membrane, it's possible that it'll damage the nerves that run just deep to the mucous membrane through this fossa. So the superior laryngeal nerve and the internal laryngeal nerve both run deep to this mucous membrane. Um, so again, a sharp object can do this, but also um, the tool that's used to remove the object can also puncture the membrane um, if you're not careful while using it. The problem here is that damaging um, damage to these nerves can then result in anesthesia of the laryngeal mucous membrane. It so can, can numb the mucous membrane of the larynx as far down as the vocal cords. Children are the population that are at the highest risk of this because kids put everything in their mouth, right? So little tiny toys, um, pennies, things they find around the house go in the mouth. Um, typically, when children swallow things, they make it through the entire GI tract and end up passing in the stool. But if they do get caught in the pharynx, it'll typically be um, in this um, pyriform fossa. You can visualize the object um, the radiograph or CT scan. It's a radiopaque area when you, um, when you look. And then it can be removed using a pharyngoscope to visualize the area. But again, um, when removing the object, you need to be really careful not to puncture the mucous membrane and then damage the nerves that are deep to the membrane. Adenoiditis is an inflammation of the adenoid. Right? Um, the adenoid, remember, is the pharyngeal tonsil. Adenoiditis can obstruct the flow of air from the nasal cavity back into the nasopharynx. Um, and because of this obstruction, the patients end up having to breathe out of the mouth. So mouth breathing is necessary because of the obstruction between the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx. Um, infection of the adenoids can spread to the tubal tonsil, which is nearby. The tubal tonsil, remember, is right by the pharyngeal orifice or the opening of the auditory tube. So swelling in the area can actually um, obstruct or close the auditory tube, and this ends up re, um, this ends up causing hearing issues right, or hearing impairment. Infection in the area of the the adenoids can also spread from the nasopharynx to the middle ear. Remember, the auditory tube
connects the nasopharynx to the middle ear, and that's how we're able to equalize pressure um, in the middle ear. This auditory tube also happens to be a route that um, bacteria or infectious organisms can take to move from the throat into the middle ear. Um, infection of the middle ear is referred to as otitis media. Here you can see adenoiditis. So, and we see the ranges from class one, which is the least severe, down to class four, which is the most severe. And you can see how the swelling goes down further and further and further. Um, and you see more and more and more occlusion as the inflammation progresses. Um, removal of the adenoids might be indicated in severe recurrent cases. A tonsillectomy is removal of the palatine tonsil. Um, we used to do this a lot for tonsillitis, um, but now typically we just give antibiotics. We don't cut them out nearly as frequently as we used to. Bleeding is a common complication. Typically the bleeding comes from the external palatine vein, um, less frequently from the tonsillar artery. The glossopharyngeal nerve runs next to the tonsillar artery on the lateral wall of the throat. Um, so it's really close to the palatine tonsil and it's vulnerable to damage during a tonsillectomy because the wall um, running over the glossopharyngeal nerve is really thin. The internal carotid artery also runs lateral to the tonsil. Um, it's vulnerable particularly if it happens to be um, tortuous, like um, kind of winding and twisting more so than it usually is. Um, in this case, the pathway isn't as predictable and it's more vulnerable to damage during the surgery. The zones of penetrating trauma are just clinical guidelines that can be used to assess the seriousness of neck trauma in different regions of the neck. They help to give an understanding of the structures that are present in each area that might be vulnerable to any sort of penetrating trauma in that region. The neck is divided up into three regions from the bottom to the top, um, zone one, zone two, and zone three. Zone one extends from the clavicle and manubrium to the inferior border of the cricoid. The structures that are present in this region include the cervical pleura, right, the top um, portion of the pleura, the um, apex of the lung, so again, the top of the lung, the thyroid and parathyroid glands, the trachea, the esophagus, the common carotid arteries, the jugular veins, and the cervical region of the spine um, and the vertebrae, or the spine and the spinal cord. Penetrating trauma in zone one um, can be associated with airway obstruction and bleed. Um, there is typically a high morbidity and mortality. Morbidity refers to um, problems that go along with the trauma. Mortality is actual fatality, or death. There's high morbidity and mortality with damage to or penetrating trauma in zone one. And a major reason is because um, visibility is difficult and access into the structures is very difficult. Zone two extends from the inferior border of the cricoid up to the angle of the mandible. This um, zone two includes the very superior portions of the thyroid gland, the larynx and laryngopharynx, the carotid um, and jugular, the esophagus, and again, the cervical region of the spine and spinal cord. Penetrating trauma to zone two is the most common, um, but it also has the least morbidity and mortality. The reason for this is the easier access um, there's a lot easier access to the structures and it's easier to compress the vessels here in order to control bleeding. Zone three is above the angle of the mandible. Um, in zone three, we have the salivary, excuse me, the salivary glands, um, the oral cavity, the nasal cavity, the oropharynx, 
and the nasopharynx. Uh, again, with zone three, airway obstruction is a problem, and it's also associated with high morbidity and mortality for the same reasons as zone one. Um, there's difficult visibility and access in zone three. Here you guys see the zones okay, for penetrating trauma. Again, zone one extends from the manubrium in the clavicle up to the inferior border of the cricoid, which you see right here. Zone two, you see from the inferior border of the cricoid to the angle of the mandible, which is right here. And then zone three is above the angle of the mandible. It's most common that um, penetrating trauma occurs in zone two, but that's also the least serious area, again, because access and visibility are um, easiest in the zone two area.